you're listening to my alien life. So that those kind of speeds exist in our galaxy, and this object came from outside of our solar system. Having a large relative velocity, if, remember objects in our in our solar in, in the galaxy are moving with relative velocities on average of between two and three hundred kilometers per second, which is much much faster than any object in our solar system. So any random object that wasn't part of our solar system happened to be traveling in the direction of our solar system, it could even easily traverse our solar system with a speed that's incredibly large. Uh, it had been tested on uh, lab mice, and it didn't, it didn't uh, kill them. And so uh, I was, uh, wasn't really that uh, uh, leery about it. I can see that there's a fear on his face. And he took off, we took off. So something was wrong there, man. Something was wrong there, man. They cut into something that they didn't know. They didn't know what was wrong there, man. And they, there was some problems. My Alien Life is recorded high atop the Northern Rocky Mountains and is heard all over the world. And you can listen everywhere. Find podcasts are found. My website is www.myalienlifepodcast.com. There you'll find links to every episode, stories, photos, the My Alien Life Legends page, and much more. Please like, comment, and subscribe, and consider becoming a patron while you're checking out all the content. I'm your host, Cameron Logan. This is My Alien Life, and the podcast starts right now. My Alien Life Podcast. Thanks, Peter, so much for joining me. You know, the last time I had you on, people would ask me afterwards for like two years, why didn't I talk about Area 51? We have a lot of listeners that probably frequent the website dreamlandresort.com. You've been a part of that a long time. How long has it been? Uh, I am. I've been been with them pretty much from the beginning when Jorg Arnu started it up and uh, trying to remember what year that was. See, because I go all the way back to uh, when Glenn Campbell was doing his Area 51 Research Center. And, you know, he didn't have a, uh, a website as extensive as Dreamland Resort, but he started a pretty good one at the time, considering, you know, how relatively new the whole internet thing was at the time. Um, but then, you know, Glenn sort of retired from the whole Area 51 uh, subject. And Jorg Arnu moved to Rachel in Las Vegas and basically took over from there. So that site has grown a lot over the last, geez, I guess uh, a couple decades now. And it's become sort of the premier website for Area 51. Close to uh, 10 million visits I saw. Somewhere between 7 and 10 million. It's, uh, yeah, it's really popular. Um there's a lot of a lot of good material on there, a lot of photographs, uh, trip reports from people who have visited the area, a lot of history. Uh, I've written a number of articles for the site, and uh, it just seems to keep getting better all the time. I don't know how long it was, and I can't even I'm dating myself, but uh, when I when I first really started to be able to do some research and look at Area 51 and, and other places, of course, that I wanted to research on the internet. I know that um, that was one of the sites that uh, I would go to, and um, over the years, I just it was cool because I got to see it fill up, you know, and um, got it. There was more content, more content, and and you had more people on board who were uh, producing more content for that. But one of the things that I like about it now, it's kind of old school, you know. It's kind of like going back in time. It hasn't changed a lot. It's looking a while. 
but um, <laughs> content certainly has changed. Um, you guys trying to keep the same look, or is it just same webmaster? But I love it. Yeah, I, I think I think York's trying to keep it pretty consistent, and uh, he does a lot of work to update the content. Of course, we're getting new material all the time, so so that's nice. I mean, when I started researching the topic of Area 51, uh, there, there was no internet. <laughs> so right, yeah. I was reduced to looking for what information I could find in books, uh, the occasional magazine article, and uh, occasionally talking to someone who might or might not know something. And it was really, really hit or miss. Nowadays, you can access so much on the internet, and uh, the CIA and the NRO have, have declassified just thousands and thousands of pages of documents that are now available online. Uh, it's, it's just amazing how much things have changed. Yeah, it's great. Um, yeah, especially for guys like you who, who um, are prolific in the field. Um, just so everybody knows who you are, and I'm sure everybody does, but fill everybody in on your, your background and, and talk about your experience as, a, as an aerospace historian. Well, uh, I guess... I guess I should start by just saying that I got interested in the subject of Area 51 back in the early 1980s when I was reading about the U-2 spy plane and how it was tested at a remote secret uh, airfield in Nevada. And just the whole concept of a a secret airbase was just really exciting. Uh, I tried to find more information and there there just wasn't anything. And uh, when I encountered people who were in a position to know about it, they couldn't talk. They said, oh, I'm sorry, I can't comment on that. So, um, you know, that just really sort of sparked my interest in the, in the history of uh, uh, secret flight testing. And, you know, I, I've had a long and varied uh, career. I, I started researching the topic when I was in college, and then after college, I uh, worked for an airline for a while and uh, then worked under various contracts for NASA. And, uh, I ended up writing a lot of books uh, on different uh, aerospace topics, aviation history, uh, technology development, program histories, aviation safety. Um, and that was just for work. And you know, as, as a side interest, I was writing about aviation archaeology and the history of uh, Area 51 and Tonopah Test Range and the Nevada Test Site. So, um, you know, it just really, it, it spun into a, a whole world I didn't expect. And, you know, next thing I knew, I was being contacted by uh, the History Channel, Discovery Channel, National Geographic, and all these others, uh, because I'd somehow inadvertently become a subject matter expert. Well, that's not too bad though. I mean, that's pretty amazing. I think, you know, I, I think one of the, uh, you know, I, it, there was a period in my life where I was trying not to watch a lot of TV, but I would watch ancient aliens and I'd watch shows like that. And, um, that's when I first encountered you and I don't know how long ago that was, but I was totally enthralled by what you had to talk about. Um, bought the books um, read up on it as much as I could. And one of the things that I was super, super interested in, I've never done that I still want to do. Um, you mentioned it, um, aerospace, um, archeology, span but you were part of the X hunters, uh, aerospace archeology span team. Are you still doing that? Are you still part of that? Well, that was, that was, again, that was something that I once again fell into kind of sideways. Right. Um, I had a lifelong interest in aviation history and particularly the history of experimental airplanes, flight testing. Um, I'd read the right stuff and yeah, all, all these different books about the test pilots and breaking the, the sound barrier and then you know, Mach 2 and 3 and the altitude records and going into space. It was just you know something that really fascinated me. And I... Uh, I came across a book in the 1970s uh, written by Ed Maloney. It was about Northrop flying wings. And he mentioned the crash of the YB-49 bomber that killed Captain Glenn Edwards. That's what Edwards Air Force Base is named after. And I love the flying wings. They're they're beautiful aircraft. Uh, It was a really innovative Mm -hmm. design ahead of its time. And Maloney wrote that 
the crash site of the YB-49 could still be seen today and that there were still pieces of wreckage out wow. in the desert. And I thought, oh, that's amazing. I'd, I'd love to go there and you know, be able to touch a piece of history. And so I uh, started asking around and doing research and roaming the desert. And eventually I, I found this site. And sure enough, there, there were pieces there. And uh, at the time, you know, I, I wasn't thinking uh, ahead to what other, other things I might look for. But I did think about the XB-70 Valkyrie, which was a bomber prototype designed to fly at Mach 3, and which crashed in 1966. And I, I started thinking about looking for that site. Well, in the early 90s, I met Tony Moore, and we both worked at Burbank Airport at the time. And uh, I mentioned that I had been to some crash sites, and he said he'd been to the XB-70. And mm. So I said, oh, that's really neat. You know, I said, where is it? Well, he'd worked really hard to find that site, and he didn't want to just give up the information to some guy he didn't know from Adam. So uh, I, I I got him to point at a map and give me kind of a general area in the desert that was like, you know, four or five square miles, which I'll tell you something, it looks pretty small on the map, but when you're out in the desert, it looks really big. And it is big. It's a, it's a big desert out there. But uh, I had a photograph uh, that I got from the Air Force that showed the burning wreckage of the plane. It was an aerial view. I was able to match up some terrain features and roads, and I figured out where this crash site was. So I went out there. Well, I went back and told Tony, I said, hey, yeah, I found it. He's like, what do you mean you found it? <laughs> you know, he couldn't believe I'd done it so quickly. So the two of us got together and we said, well, gee, what else could we find? And uh, Tony said, well, how about the X-15? And we were off and running. So uh, we spent a lot of time uh, doing research, particularly at the history office at Edwards Air Force Base and other places, libraries and archives. And we tried to get as much information as we could to locate the spot where the X-15 rocket plane crashed in 1967. And we, we spent some time out in the desert wandering around, not finding anything. Uh, and it was pretty frustrating, but eventually we did find it. And, uh, you know, then we realized that, you know, there was so much else out there. We started with uh, just a few few aircraft to look for. And I mean, you know, there have been a lot of different research plans that crashed, particularly in the 1950s and 60s, when uh, it was the cutting edge of technology. The learning curve was really steep. Uh, being a test pilot was very hazardous, much more so than it is today. I mean, it still can be, but not as, not as much as it was then. And uh, so we started looking for things, and we, we began bringing artifacts back to the museum at Edwards and giving them to the curator. And every time we told him that we'd found some site, he'd go to this file drawer and pull out a little list and look at it and check something off. And Turns out he had a, a list called the Edwards Air Force Base Crash Log. And it took a long time to gain his trust enough to get a copy of it. But when we did, it turned out to be a list of about 129 different aircraft wrecks dating from about 1935 to 1992. We thought, wow, that's a lot of crash sites, 129. Well, as it turns out, that's a drop in the bucket. Uh, I have since updated the Edwards crash log, and my version starts in 1930 and continues to the present and has more than 700 entries. Wow. And that's covering an area of uh, about within a 150-mile radius of Edwards Air Force Base. That's very cool. Yeah, I think, I don't know, you know, I um, my background is in archaeology, but um, aerospace archaeology, to me, would be the would be would be the ultimate. I mean, it's it's pretty amazing. How many wrecks do you think that you've found solely on your own before anybody else? Well, um, I've I know I've visited more than a hundred different crash sites. Um, some of them were ones that I don't really think anybody had seen, probably you know, since since the accident happened, or right. very few people knew about them. You know, it's the, the community of people who look for crash sites is 
is relatively small uh, and it tends to break down into people with particular niche interests. So you'll have uh, folks who are interested in warbirds, say, you know, World War II vintage aircraft. And you've got some people who look for airliner wrecks. Um, Tony and I decided to concentrate primarily on experimental and flight test aircraft. And nobody else had really done that. So we, we kind of ha had a little bit of an advantage. As it turned out, you know, word got out and other people were interested in that subject and began getting into it more and more. So, um, you know, some of those sites have been visited quite a bit now. And uh, some people have even put up monument markers, uh, memorials and such at various sites. So why do you think that people weren't interested in looking for, for, for test crash sites? Because, I mean, obviously there's some notorious crashes that have occurred in the United States, but to me, what you were looking at is, is more interesting. I mean, it's, it's fascinating because a lot of times the, those planes were one of a kind. That's absolutely true. And uh, I agree that they are among the, uh, the more interesting ones to look for. I think that the main reason that people did not go after them is because conventional wisdom was, you know, you'd be wasting your time. The government cleaned up every trace. In fact, uh, almost every time we asked somebody for information when we were searching, you know, if we said, oh, yeah, we're, you know, we're looking for the crash site of the X-2 or the X-15 or whatever, uh, whatever we said, you know, the response was almost universally someone saying, well, you're wasting your time. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they cleaned up everything. There's, there's nothing left. Um, and that was never true. <laughs> it was any any place where something crashed, there was always debris left over unless it had been physically paved over and there were some sites that were paved over and you know because the uh communities out in the desert have have grown and expanded their, their boundaries quite a bit so you know if something crashed on the edge of town well the edge of town now is much further out but for the sites that were out you know in the middle of nowhere out in the desert we were pretty much guaranteed to find something you have archaeologists who are um basically research based and then and then you have archaeologists that are obviously collectors were you a collector did you bring anything home yeah sure i i found some stuff that i kept for reference material um and a lot of the stuff we found went to the museum and a lot of the stuff just remained behind and you know not everybody you know leaves things i've i've certainly seen a lot of crash debris show up on ebay lately so <laughs> No, yeah. it's it's there are different approaches to it. There's um, it, Tony used to say that the the two types of, of people who went looking for the crash sites, there were the hunter gatherers and the monument builders. <laughs> so, right. you know, the, the monument builders were the ones who put up the memorials. So why didn't they collect everything? Because obviously, um, you know, there's people out there, and if it's that easy to find, the technology might mean something. But then again, did they just leave behind worthless? information well it varied um there were times when a great effort was expended to clean up a site but because of the nature of the you know crash i mean it's a it's a big vehicle it's hitting the ground real hard it's you know exploding uh, pieces go flying all over the place some of them are driven into the earth and you know get uncovered later through erosion or you know if someone comes along and, and digs it up it's just really, really hard to completely remove all traces, even when you really, really try. And I mean, I've seen some sites where some effort was expended. Then on the other end of the spectrum, there were times when the Air Force would come along and they just push the wreckage into the crater and cover it over. And so the whole thing was basically there. <laughs> um, and in, in some cases, if it was, you know, on a mountainside or whatever, they'd you know, it was just too difficult to remove and they'd leave it there. You know, nowadays, uh, airplanes are made of composite materials. There's a lot more environmental regulations dealing with, uh, you know, carbon fibers and hazardous materials and chemicals. And so, mm -hmm. you know, there's, there's more incentive to, uh, to clean up crash site than there, there would have been previously. For sure. Um, any estimate on how many aircraft left, we're talking about Area 51, left that area um, that test range and crashed outside of the boundaries that um, people had access to? Well, uh, there have been a number of them, and 
And I've certainly been to a few. There was the, the U-2 prototype, uh, crashed in 1957 right. during a test of anti-radar materials. Uh, that was uh, in central Nevada, well away from the uh, restricted range areas. Uh, a couple of the A-12s crashed off-site, uh, one in southern Nevada, another uh, in northern Nevada, close to the Utah state line. Uh, there have been various uh, stealth fighters that crashed off range. Um, SR-71s, you know, a lot of interesting exotic stuff. I suppose that, yeah, realistically, they could get away from that range pretty quick and be, you know, in another state within seconds sometimes. And and um, hard to contain it where people can't get to it for the most part. It, it, it's true. I mean, when you're, when you're testing a plane... You know, to its maximum capability is like the Blackbird. You know, you need to be able to fly across the country because right. uh, the turning radius alone at Mach three, you know, is something like you know probably close to a hundred miles. <laughs> Amazing. So, um, when did you first become aware that there was a secret military base somewhere out there in Nevada, and uh, what was that moment like, and and did you pursue it immediately? I first read about it uh, in a book by Jay Miller about the U-2. That uh, was probably about 1983. And uh, I pursued it to the extent that I looked looked at maps. I tried to find other books and articles. There, there wasn't much available at the time. Um, and I have to say, I probably squandered some good opportunities you know, to actually drive out in the desert and get close to it. I didn't didn't even try to do that. And I was going to uh, college at the time, so, you know, my resources and, and free time was relatively limited anyway. So it wasn't until uh, much later when I met Glenn Campbell that I started, you know, really doing even more research. And, of course, over time, uh, I met a lot of people, test pilots uh, who had retired, who flown the U-2 or the Blackbird or stealth aircraft and, you know, hearing their stories firsthand was, was really neat. Uh, You know, because it's it's not just the hardware, it's the people who design and built and and flew these things. It's really a a, a real story of achievement, technical achievement, uh, engineering capabilities, and just the fact that some of these guys were willing to strap in and, and fly these really unusual configurations for the first time ever. Yeah, that's in, that's incredible. Um, so when you first found out about it, was there an explanation on exactly what was going on there? Did you have a good idea? I mean, I'm sure you had a good idea, but. Um, well, I, I think, I think the way I entered into the subject, you know, I came at it, straight into the story of the U-2 and then later the, the A-12, you know, the Blackbird. So, you know, on, on that level, I was just looking at it as an aircraft test site. Um, and everything I, everything I read and everybody I talked to, you know, that was just basically it. It was, it was simply, it was, it was like Edwards Air Force Base and that it was a place to test uh, high-tech airplanes, mm-hmm. but it was secret. And that was the only thing unusual about it. But most people, I think, who have been introduced to the subject have been uh, brought in through the other path of UFOs, flying saucers, the whole Bob Lazar sure. story and aliens and all that, which has become uh, really the popular culture face of Area 51. So I was just coming at it from a very uh, grounded viewpoint and never even heard any UFO stories until much, much later when, uh, you know, in the, in the later, you know, when they got into the internet era and Bob Lazar showed up and started talking about reverse engineering flying saucers. And uh, so I, I never had that, that perspective. Right. So when, when you knew that it was a secret base back then, um, what did, what did secretive mean? I mean, what exactly was that like? Because obviously you know, there was air bases all over the country and international, um, and, and we knew about those. But but when you started looking into that, it wasn't even named or, you know, what was it known as? 
the various terms I heard were Watertown, uh, Area 51, Groom Lake, obviously, which is just mm-hmm. a, the main geographical feature. And uh, later, Dreamland, which uh, was used primarily for the airspace overhead. Um, you know, I, I would talk to people who you know, were in the, the military, and if they did happen to know something about it, they'd, you know, they'd just shut down the conversation if I tried to, to ask any real questions about it. They said, I can't talk about it. I mean, you knew it was there, um, and there were aerial photos of it that had been published. So you know, it, it was pretty clear that it, it wasn't, the existence of it wasn't secret. And in fact, if you go back and look at old newspaper articles, um, it was publicized as early as 1955 when it was, you know, just being built. The, uh, the, the CIA was uh, funding it at the time and they hid their involvement behind the Atomic Energy Commission since Groom Lake is right next to the nuclear test area. So the Atomic Energy Commission came out with a press release saying, you know, we're, we're building a little airfield up by Groom Lake and it's just going to be used for, you know, testing and stuff. And but they didn't they didn't really, you know, make a big deal about it. Um, eventually, there was a story that it was going to be used for this new U-2 plan for weather research, which, of course, was a cover story. Um, but oddly enough, even that early in the game, uh, the news media caught wind of the fact that this was really something kind of spooky. And so they started calling it the super secret proving grounds within the proving grounds. Hmm. And it, it's kind of had that, that uh, reputation from the very beginning. And every now and then there'd be some headline like jet crashes at super secret base and things like that. And the term area 51 showed up in the, in the newspapers, but because this was, before uh, the internet and before the 24-hour news cycles, you know, it, it didn't really get a, a whole lot of attention in the public eye. So what was the layout in the uh, early, let's say in the early 60s and 70s? Um, what was actually there? Well, when, when it was first built in 1955 for the U2 program, there was just a 5,000-foot airstrip and uh, – the lake bed and a few little hangars and buildings and, you know, not much else. What, what, was year, was, what be, year was that, Peter? 1955. Gotcha. And it was meant to be a temporary camp uh, only for the time when they would test the U-2 and train CIA and Air Force pilots to fly the U-2. And once those aircraft had been deployed to their forward operating bases, uh, the Groom Lake facility, which was then known as Watertown Airstrip, was going to be shut down. And it was. It was mothballed in 1957. And it remained that way for, you know, close to two years. And during that time, uh, the CIA realized that the U-2 would become vulnerable to uh, Russian surface-to-air missiles. There needed to be a new airplane, something that could be more survivable, fly higher and faster. And so Lockheed was again called in to design an aircraft, and they created what became the A-12, the first of the Blackbirds under Project Oxcart. Well, uh, CIA needed a place to test those airplanes, and the Watertown airstrip was not going to cut it. The the runway uh, was too short. It wouldn't support the weight of the aircraft. The base infrastructure was not sufficient by any means for the kind of operation they were looking at. So uh, the agency went looking at Air Force bases that were programmed for closure and said, well, maybe we can use one of them. Problem was all of those bases were close to cities and there was just, you know, you didn't have that security. So eventually someone said, all right, we're going to shell out the money and build a full-scale air base at Groom Lake. So in the early 1960s, uh, they came in and put up a lot more housing, you know, a bunch of hangars, new parking ramps, a brand new runway, 8,500 feet long with a 5,000 foot overrun. Uh, the lake bed was still usable for uh, emergency and crosswind landings. And uh, it became a full-fledged air base and a permanent facility. And uh, again, though, the CIA only used it for as long as they needed to. And eventually they wanted to get out of the airplane business. And that was in the... Uh, 
60s and 70s. So the A-12 program got shut down um, in 1968. And by that time, the Air Force was coming in with uh, some secret projects of their own as a tenant to the CIA. The CIA still operated the base. And they allowed the Air Force to come in and test a Russian MiG-21 and some MiG-17s. And the CIA had some other smaller projects too with drones. But uh, in the late 70s, the agency decided, you know, we don't want responsibility for this big air base anymore. So they just transferred it over to the Air Force. And it's been an Air Force facility ever since. I always assumed that there was an on again, off again relationship with the CIA. But once they were gone, were they gone for good? Uh, they, they, they were gone to the extent that they no longer ran the place, but, um, I, I've been led to believe they probably have, have come back to do work, uh, as a tenant, sort of the, the, the role reversal between CIA and the air force, you know, so, you know, one, one is in charge of the base, the other is coming in to do projects from time to time. So, uh, it's, it's an evolving relationship. So back in the early 25 to 30 years, what was the uh, access to the place like? I mean, how pe- how were people getting to work if they lived to the west or if they lived in, um, or if, I'm sorry, if they lived to the east or the north or from Las Vegas? Well, if they were, if they were, if they were closer, relatively closer to Groom Lake, um, people would typically take a, a bus or other vehicle into the base there are a couple of gates. Uh, one of them is used uh, up north by people who live in the town of Rachel and those communities. And if they were down in Alamo, uh, they come through a different gate. Uh, there's a, a bus base there that would, would bring people in. And for the folks down in Vegas and other locations, uh, there were air air commuters, uh, 737s and uh, King Airs and Beach 1900s. How long has that been going on, though? I mean... Uh, to me, I thought it was relatively new. And when I say that, the uh, large airplanes, I thought in the last 25 years, but um, further back. Uh, ab- absolutely. From the from the very beginning, there's, there's always been some type of commuter shuttle aircraft. Uh, in the 1950s, it was a DC-3 and some C-54s. Uh, the C-54s were provided by the Air Force in the uh, uh, Subsequent years, you know, the 1960s, Lockheed had several Constellation airliners that they used to bring people in from Burbank and Las Vegas. Um, there was another company called Carco that had some some smaller aircraft, and eventually EG and G got a contract. And uh, you know, between Lockheed and EG and G uh, in the 1980s. Uh, you started seeing a much, much more, uh, a much larger, more organized airline type operation, uh, eventually with six 737s. And those aircraft have been replaced uh, over the years from time to time. So the ones you're seeing today are not the same ones they started with back in the 1980s. The, uh, the old 200 models have been replaced by modern 600, uh, the DAV 737-600 series. And, uh, they'll fly in from places like Las Vegas or Palmdale or wherever, you know, just hundreds and hundreds of people. I mean, there's a couple thousand people working out there. Right. So uh, it's a pretty substantial base population and moving all those folks in and out every, every day is, is a chore. Uh, a number of them actually stay out there during the week in dormitories. So uh, the way I heard it, uh, contractors were encouraged to stay throughout the week rather than fly back and forth every day. And cash incentives were, uh, were offered for that. So you, you can make some pretty good bonuses. In your best estimation, what would the average workday look like at Area 51 if, um, if you were starting out and you lived in Las Vegas? Well, the, the, the flights get going pretty early in the morning um, and they run throughout the day. So you'll have folks maybe boarding at five in the morning, five thirty, six o'clock, and so on. And uh, uh, the shifts just go back and forth throughout the day to uh, Groom Lake and Tonopah Test Range. You know, there's a there's a huge uh, 
range area out there, the Nevada Test and Training Range. Of course, you got multiple airfields, uh, Groom Lake, Tonopah, there's a small airfield at uh, Yucca Flat, which um, uh, I think was primarily used early on by Lockheed Martin, but then later by probably other other outfits for unmanned aerial vehicles. So Lockheed Martin is interesting to me because um, in my in my uh, research and and being in different government facilities, I used to see actual government. Or, I'm sorry, Lockheed Martin computers and um, other pieces of hardware with that name on it. Um, to me, I guess. I always thought they're involved in aircraft, but I think they're involved in much more. Well, that's certainly true of any of the uh, uh, the prime contractors we know of. Lockheed Martin, which, I mean, just by its name, you can see they've merged Lockheed with Martin Marietta. Northrop merged with Grumman to become Northrop Grumman. And there are other smaller companies that merged with both of those to, to uh, fill out different business areas. And of course, Boeing, which uh, has bought up <laughs> everything in sight. So uh, when I was young, there were lots and lots of big companies. And now there are you know, several really huge companies that are made up of all these previous smaller ones. And they have their fingers in a lot of different pies in the military industrial complex, um, defense, commercial, just, um, you know, they're, they're everywhere. So describe the uh, term black projects and, and what do you consider to the three most important black projects that came out of Area 51? <laughs> well, the, the, first question is, the first question is easy enough. Um, a, a black program, you know, that's just a way of saying that it's, it's really, really secret. Um, a, a black program is usually an unacknowledged special access program. And special access means that anyone who's involved has to have a need to know uh, for whatever it is that they're working on. And if they have a specific need to know for a particular part of a program or for a large segment of the program, you know, they will be briefed in, you know, given a, a briefing told what they need to know and also told not to talk about what they know because they'll get in a huge amount of trouble. Um, and so they basically sign their life away saying they won't, won't talk about this stuff un, until or, or if it's declassified. And there are acknowledged black programs and unacknowledged black programs. And the unacknowledged are the ones where, you know, you might hear a rumor that there's a stealth fighter and the, the government says, uh, we don't know what you're talking about which of course is a blatant lie because uh, there, you know, there is such a program, but they, they, they're telling you there isn't. Uh, and then there are the acknowledged black programs where they say, yeah, we're, we're working on a, a new stealth bomber, but we're not going to tell you anything about it. And so, you know, you know that it's out there, you know, it's being worked on, but the details are, are hidden away. And uh, probably a good example of, of that type of program today is the uh, next you know, next generation air dominance, which is a, a program to design a new fighter plane. And, you know, when, when I started hearing about this, I thought, well, this is basically a, a paper airplane. It's a, it's a study program. They're looking at technologies and stuff. And the aviation press pretty much uh, agreed with that line. Everybody just sort of thought it was, you know, a bunch of people in a think tank, but in reality, uh, hardware was being produced and demonstrators were being flown. And that was acknowledged not too long ago by uh, senior defense officials. So they have actually built the prototypes for uh, future fighter plans and tested them. You know, if, if you say, well, gee, where did you test that? They say at a remote location and that's it. <laughs> you, don't, you don't get any information, but it's pretty, pretty fair guess that it was probably groom like. So Dreamland Resort, the website says most of the employees at Area 51 are contractors. What percentage are military um, and what branches are represented there? Is, is it, yeah, I always kind of wondered that because I, you know, now you hear so much about contractors, but uh, you know, how many, how many branches of our military are represented there? Well, first of all, the, the population at Groom Lake alone is probably about 2,500 people more or less. And you're looking at about 500 uh, of those are a combination of uniform military and 
military civil service. And then the other 2000 are contractors and there are lots of different companies. And of course, you've also got uh, different branches of the services uh, may be involved in one program or another, uh, Navy, Marines, Army, you know, everybody who has some project that, you know, that they can test out there you know, has done so. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty much uh, uh, open to, to all the, the services. So I've looked and looked and looked at that site, you know, and in the surrounding areas in every direction so many, so many times. And it's, it's very, very interesting, especially with Google maps for a while. And I don't know if this still exists because I haven't seen it the last few times that I looked, but um, I, there was a taco John's listed. I mean, it, it would pinpoint an actual taco John's there. Somebody told me there was a Wendy's um, with so much material, obviously that comes in and, and out of that place. I mean, how could they, how could they realistically have such a secure site? Because obviously, I mean, people that work there, I had heard a a price tag for security at that place was up to 150,000 per person. Um, Some, some top secret clearances taking months to achieve. So when you have trucks going in and out of there, just loaded with stuff, um, how do they maintain security? I mean, it just seems like a daunting task. It, it, it is, and you're not wrong about the, the costs of security. Every single person who works there, from the commander on down to the you know, custodial service, has to have some sort of clearance. Now, obviously, uh, there's a lot of compartmentalization. Not everybody is briefed into all aspects of what's going on. Everybody just needs, they, they've just got the information they need to do their specific jobs. But still, the process of getting a clearance is exceedingly time consuming and expensive because there are background investigations, a lot of paperwork. And you, know, you were talking about an investigation taking months. The, the reality is that it's so backed up that it can take uh, a year, a couple of years to get a clearance. Um, you know, it's insane. And I mean, you know, you can give a person an interim clearance to do. Uh, to do their work, but um, in in some cases, a person might be, you know, sort of warehoused in a part of uh, a part of the, the facility where they're not really having access to everything they need to to do their job until their clearance comes through. So it can be quite complex. And you know, as I said, you know, a population of twenty five hundred people, but you know they're not always the same people. So if you start doing the math on it over the years and years and years that the base has been in operation, you're getting thousands and thousands of people who have had access of one type or another to that facility. And of course, they've, they've all been uh, given the debriefing, told, uh, you know, you've, you've signed your security oath, you can't talk about this. And so, uh, you know, you just have to kind of hope that they're trustworthy and that when they, they leave their jobs and go somewhere else, you know, that they won't uh, uh, be disgruntled and re- reveal things that they shouldn't. And so far it seems like, uh, you know, it's been pretty effective because there are a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of programs that are still secret today that have taken place. We know nothing about them. You asked me, you know, what I thought were the most important programs to, uh, to yep. take place there. And I'm not sure that we, I'm not sure that we can totally know the answer to that because we don't know all the programs that have taken place there. Certainly the ones that have been declassified, um, you know, the, uh, the blackbirds were a, you know, really a, a quantum leap and leap in uh, aviation technology, the development of materials and construction methods and propulsion life support, you know, that, that probably has a lot of, uh, a lot of different applications that, uh, you know, have, have gone into other parts of aerospace. And uh, of course, the stealth revolution uh, of the 1970s, uh, hugely influenced the uh, direction of, of war fighting today. Back in the 1970s, you could see artist concepts of what future fighter aircraft were going to look like. And they're going to be highly maneuverable and have canards and all these kind of things. 
And that didn't really happen because the stealth revolution came along and all of a sudden airplanes were now being designed to be invisible to radar. So that meant certain kinds of shaping, certain kinds of material, and it just changed the whole direction of aircraft design for military purposes for a while. So that had a huge influence. And there, there are probably things that uh, might be declassified someday that will, will be even more amazing. So this is a question that um, I didn't even write down, and, and I know I should have, but uh, excuse me while I stumble through this and, and formulate this a bit. But um, it seems to me, and I make this point often, that, um, and you mentioned people when they, you know, thousands and thousands of people who previously worked there who exited, you know, and, and were still under security clearance. Um, you know, we do have a few people out there who who have gone out and um, supposedly they had worked there and now they're, they're talking about it, but that's a handful. We don't hear that much. Um, you know, I, I, I have a person that works for me that um, has still has a top secret clearance in the Navy, hasn't worked in the Navy for the Navy for 12 years, but still can't talk about any of that. But yet I have people out there who have told me face to face that they had worked at area 51 and it's been over 25 years and they can talk about most of what went on there. How do you respond to that? Yeah, well, that's, uh, <laughs> that's certainly the, the challenge for, uh, for anyone who's interested in learning the history uh, of area 51 is that, you know, a lot of things have been declassified. And so that's great. You know, we can, sure. we can talk about that. We can read about it. The agencies and companies involved uh, release pictures and documents. But there are also uh, many, many programs that have not been re revealed openly. We know they exist uh, because, you know, people disappear into this, this black world and, you know, they're, they're off uh, in, in Nevada for a while and you say, oh, you know, what, are you, what are you doing? What have you been doing? And they say, well, I can't talk about it. You know, maybe someday. Uh, I talked to one test pilot who, uh, in his, his official Air Force biography, it said he was the first Air Force pilot to fly a classified prototype aircraft called the YF-113G. And uh, the way... The way it was phrased was that he took this aircraft from development to first flight. So, although the term classified prototype is often used for, you know, some of these secret Russian airplanes that they fly, when you start talking about from design to, you know, to first flight, it sounds like something brand new. And, you know, I, I asked him about it, of course, and he said, well, you know, I, I can't talk about that now. And he did say that, uh, he posed for a photo next to the aircraft. And so there's this picture of him, like a hero shot mm -hmm. and it's waiting for him in a vault somewhere for if they ever declassify it. And uh, if they do, then he'll get a copy of that photo and uh, ho hopefully he'll live long enough to, to, to do that. That was back in the, the 1990s that he was, was flying this thing and it still hasn't been declassified. So there are a lot of things like that that are still hidden away and, uh, you know, some of them will probably be uh, fairly mundane and others may be quite exotic. Um, but we may, we may never hear about them. Yeah. Have you ever had known any case where, um, somebody left area 51 and got a little too, uh, loose with their lips and, and suffered consequences? Um, not, not really the, the closest, that I can say um, that came to that. Um, and it's sort of a strange case because the person involved uh, was, in my experience, notorious for keeping their mouth shut. I mean, to the extent that he didn't even log his flight time in the classified aircraft he flew. You know, and every pilot logs his flight time. And I mean, religiously, to the point where you know, they even came up with, you know, some unclassified designations for classified aircraft just for the purposes of being able to log time. And this guy was so tight-lipped that he wouldn't even log his time. But 
he got in a little hot water. Um, he was was flying you know, one one program, and uh, he, he did just great. And another program, he did great. And then this other one, he uh, he made some flights, and then he said something to the wrong person, and you know he basically was talking out of school, and so he wasn't on that program anymore, from what I hear. And uh, I'm not going to name any names, only because. Uh, you know, he's not around to defend himself anymore. And um, I, I don't have any additional confirmation of that. But it it, it is interesting that he, he did only you know, stay with this one program for such a short time uh, after being so heavily involved in others. So uh, you, I guess, you know, when you're in that world, you just have to be really careful. We know a lot of things go into um, Area 51 and we know very little about what comes out. And, and I'm not speaking in terms of anything very technical here, but what about the trash? Um, I, you know, I've read um, stories about uh, burning fire pits and, and chemicals. I've read stories about and seen actual photos of buildings that had been damaged and um, hadn't been repaired for months or years. Um, there was a hangar that part of the roof had lifted off. Um, supposedly a state of the art facility. Um, sometimes part of it looks in disrepair from, from actual photographs from actual people that have taken yeah, them I over think, the years. Uh, as for the hangar roof incident, that might've been more cosmetic than anything too critical, but the, the issue of the, the trash and disposal of, of classified waste right. certainly became a, a huge issue in the 1990s because there were some lawsuits involving people who had worked out there and been exposed to the fumes from burning waste products. Uh, and, you know, you hear about that same sort of thing now uh, taking place in, in Afghanistan. Yes. Uh, where some of our troops were exposed to, you know, the, the burning materials and are now suffering health problems. But, in regards to Area 51, um, in the in the 1980s, um, you know when they were working on the stealth plans, particularly a lot of those materials used to coat the stealth aircraft. Uh, you know they're full of plastics and composites, and you know they're they're not terrible just by themselves. But if you set them on fire, it releases all <laughs> kinds of really nasty chemicals into the atmosphere and supposedly um, that sort of material as well as just ordinary trash and electronic waste like computers and just you know old classified papers and just everything you could imagine that they needed to get rid of was being thrown into trenches um, near Groom Lake and set on fire you know they'd pour fuel oil on it and just light it up you know week after week after week and the trenches were located uh, near the old firefighting area, which is pretty much almost right next to the dormitories. So this toxic smoke would blow over the main part of the base and the living area. And, uh, you know, people were breathing it in and it was bad news. And uh, the purpose of the lawsuit was to try to get these folks, you know, some compensation. They lost their case um, primarily because of security reasons. You know, the government said, hey, um, if we, you know, start telling you about these chemicals that we had out there, that's going to give away, you know, uh, state secrets. So uh, it was it was ultimately, uh, I mean, and I don't understand why they didn't just simply pay the people, give them some compensation and have done with it, but that's not the way it worked. And in the end, uh, they lost their case and the government said, we're declaring that, um, you know, for legal purposes, you know, basically what goes on in area 51 stays in area 51. We don't have to release any information about, um, you know, what we have there in terms of chemicals or materials and, and, you know, we can do what we want. Now the air force could have very easily taken that as carte blanche to just keep doing what they were doing, but they didn't. And that's good news. And we can see this is good, that there's some good news by studying the satellite imagery, uh, like we find on Google Earth. 
Uh, the satellite imagery shows us that in the years since the lawsuit, that burn trench area has been completely cleaned up and uh, you know the damage mitigated, it's been filled in with clean fill. The parking ramps uh, where the you know, fuel has been spilled and de-icing fluid and oils, and lubricants, and every other thing, you know, those have been dug up and replaced with new clean concrete. You know, a lot of work has been done to clean up the environmental problems at the base and the areas where trash is disposed, uh, that's now done in, in clean landfills, which are located as far away from the housing area as possible. So, um, you know, we, we can see that you know the the Air Force decided to be a, a relatively good steward in the long run and uh, clean up their act. I would think that uh, you know out in the desert there would be plenty of places to bury trash. However, I noticed that in the last twenty years or so, and um, especially like you mentioned with Google Maps and Google Earth, that it's getting kind of crowded out there. Especially, you know. Any place that's not radioactive and had many nuclear bombs going off, there's there's activity out there. It, it, it's true. There's a surprising amount of uh, population out in really remote places. I often wonder, well, what are these folks doing for a living? Because <laughs> there's, exactly. there's just no obvious, uh, uh, no, no obvious source of income. My good friend B.J. Evans worked as a military heating and air conditioning technician at Area 51 and suffered, he says, quote unquote, um, health consequences um, that weren't due to chemical related burning um, that uh, doctors aren't able to identify. Um, Are there other people claiming that they have health problems that, that can't be explained by modern medicine? Uh, I haven't heard of that, uh, other than the ones who were exposed to the uh, the, the top toxic you know, burning fumes. Uh, but there's certainly a lot of other other stuff out there. You know, on the Nevada Test and Training Range, that's a you know, about a twelve thousand square mile area that's just full of you know bomb residue, uh, radiation, chemicals, uh, so many different things, and it's it's hard to keep that contained. And a lot of the old facilities, which you know, many of them now have been replaced, but the older ones had quite a bit of asbestos in the buildings. You know, so uh, you take, your, take your choice. There's a, a place on the highway not far from the town of Rachel where the radiation levels are higher than at any other place in the surrounding area. And that's simply that it was in the, the, the downwind path from the above ground nuclear testing. And, uh, you know, there's, there's just a lot of, a lot of things out there. Your book, um, about the nuclear test site is awesome. And that's what we talked about last time you were on, um, the Nevada test site rather. Um, I, you know, I asked you this question, but I can't remember the answer and it really fascinates me. I mean, the Nevada test site is just West of there. Um, and, uh, St. George, Utah had quite a bit of radiation there. So why didn't area 51 become totally in and, inundated and totally uninhabitable because of the radiation from so many well, nuclear bombs. And, and the thing of course, is that the, uh, the people testing the bombs uh, paid a lot of attention to the weather and what, what direction the winds were blowing. And so when the bombs were set off, they usually did it at times when the wind was blowing away from Las Vegas and Los Angeles. Unfortunately, uh, that meant the wind was blowing towards St. George, Utah and Salt Lake City. And if you look at the maps, you'll see the Groom Lake is indeed uh, in the downwind path. And um, it got quite a, quite a fair amount of fallout. When the Watertown airstrip was mothballed in the summer of 1957, the Atomic Energy Commission sent uh, radiation safety monitors out there to set up instrumentation in the buildings at Groom Lake and the vehicles that were parked there to measure 
the radioactive fallout from the above ground test series. And of course, that was that was a pretty clever thing to do because that little you know little air base that was kind of a you know essentially a, a model small town, you know, with the same kind of building materials you'd find in any other American small town. So it uh, it became sort of a, a realistic laboratory to test fallout. And of course, you had a uh, there was a test to the northwest of Groom Lake, about five miles. It was called Project 57. It was a safety experiment, they called it, where you take a nuclear weapon. And of course, if you know, you know how a nuclear weapon functions, it's got a, an implosion device with a bunch of detonators all fired at exactly the same time to compress the plutonium core. Well, for the safety experiment, they only fired one or two detonators. You know, to simulate an accident, like if you were to drop a nuclear bomb, you know, by accident or during sure. transport. And this blasted the plutonium core into dust and spread it over, you know, thousands of acres. And that was a, an opportunity to, to test both the safety of the weapons design and also cleanup methods. So you've got this spot five miles northwest of Groom Lake where you know, it was all dusted with plutonium. And the government put a fence around it, but of course the winds blow and, you know, the radioactive material doesn't always stay inside the fence. So there are little radiation monitoring stations out there to, to see where the plume is going. A lot of places like that out in that area. Yeah, that's incredible. So the other thing that my good friend BJ Evans also stated that there are contractors and there are employees that are not of this world working there for the reason, sole reason, because they're able to work with radiation and they're able to work with asbestos. You mentioned aspe- asbestos, so, um, yeah. You don't even have to comment on that one. But. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so the one thing that he does bring up, and, and other people have brought up as well, that there is a secret site out there known as S4. What do you know about it? And um, we know what you've heard, but what do you know about it? Right. Well, the uh, the S four story is kind of a it, it's a a garbled <laughs> half myth. Uh, when Bob Lazar came out in 1989 and said, "Hey, I was out there reverse engineering flying saucers," he claimed that he did it at a place called S four which was supposedly south of Groom Lake, around the other side of the Papoose Mountains, next to Papoose Dry Lake. And of course, uh, all the people I've ever met who've been out there in various capacities, from base commanders to security guards, have said, you know, no, that's ridiculous. There's nothing at Papoose Lake. You know, and if you look at the satellite photos, um, you know, there's nothing to to be seen there. And uh, I don't believe that you could easily camouflage a, a facility, you know, of the size that Bob Lazar was claiming. And recently a guy I know flew a Cessna over Papoose Lake and took yeah. some pictures and, and still there's, there's nothing there. Right. But uh, there is a place called Site 4, which is up near Tonopah Test Ranch. And that is also part of the complex associated with Groom Lake and Tonopah. And Site 4 is a radar complex with a bunch of Russian radars and simulated Russian radars. They're used for testing, uh, you know, anti-threat systems, electronic warfare, uh, stealth aircraft and the like. So it's, it's possible that, you know, the Site 4 and the S4 story are just sort of mixed together. And and that, uh, frankly, I don't believe the S4 Pepu's Lake story at all. But Site 4, you can see that on the satellite image. Right. Have you ever met T.D. Barnes? Oh, yeah. I know T.D. very well. Yeah. I've known him for many years. So I've I've worked with him and the, the Roadrunners to you know help preserve their history. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, the Roadrunners are a great group. I love T.D. Barnes and, and had him on the show. And and talk to him at length. And of course he's a very um, empirical talker. I mean, it's basically like talking to a scientist and, and he was heavily involved in, in the development of radar there and, and 
you know, saw all kinds of things and was able to witness um, different flights of different uh, different um, U.S. craft that, that we've developed over the years. But, um, you know, so to me, that's really fascinating. I consider our test pilots uh, true American heroes, and I can't even imagine doing that job. But um, I think they probably had one of the coolest jobs ever. Yeah. But, you know, of course, I have I have a varied group of, of people that I have on the show and, and um, try to talk to people in every walks of life and, and experiences as well. But one of the, you know, when I talked to TD Barnes and, and had him on, I was very excited because it was a great show. And of course um, he wasn't able to provide any alien UFO evidence for people who were listening. And, and there were people who were disappointed. And, and one of the pe- people that I've talked to in the past and, and a message from every now and then, and uh, particularly back then, I would mes- message him quite often was John Lear. And I wanted, you know, John Lear to listen to this podcast. So I messaged John Lear and and um, sent him the, the podcast. And, you know, it was about the podcast. I said, hey, I got this podcast it's about T.D. Barnes and it's great. You know, I'd like you to listen to it. And he didn't answer me, didn't answer me. And like three weeks later, finally, he answered me and said, T.D. Barnes is an asshole. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I don't even know where that came from. I didn't go into it, but I, I think T.D. Barnes is absolutely amazing. And, and, yeah, um, T.D. is great. And, uh, you know, he had a, a pretty varied career himself. He worked at the Nevada test site for a while with the nuclear rocket engine development. Right. Uh, he was at the NASA radar sites uh, on the high range that followed the experimental aircraft. Uh, in fact, when I was uh, working at the NASA Dryden Flight Research Center, I've came across some uh, radar maps that were from the, the different sites that were recorded X-15 flights. And a few of them had Barnes's name on there as the radar operator. So that was really, really kind of fun to see. Um, I've met John Lear. I've known him for a long time. Right. Uh, we've, you know, I haven't talked to him in many, many years, but, you know, he used to come up with these really just bizarre outlandish uh you know, tales of things with with aliens and secret bases on the moon and and stuff like that. I mean, he had you know he'd draw on maps of Utah and say, you know, now this is where the secret underground base is. Mm-hmm. And, you know, a lot of the time those were places I was familiar with, and I'm like, yeah, I don't think I believe that. <laughs> and he just, um, but well, he's, uh, you know, if you talk to him and and you know this, um, you know the the way he. Sp- speaks and um he was totally different than i thought he would be he was just so gracious and, and the nicest yeah. guy in the world and um yeah. and i know he still is and i always wish him well because i think he's a super cool guy and um super interesting um the, the whole story is interesting on you know basically how um people suddenly decided that you know that there were alien craft there and and there was aliens there um you probably get asked that a lot. What's your usual answer? Well, you know, when, when I first started hearing about area 51, I never heard any stories about flying saucers. Right. Um, the ones that you mostly hear nowadays all originate with Bob Lazar. And that came out in 1989. Uh, if you look back through the history of Groom Lake and try to find other stories, there's really only, only ever one that had any kind of uh, meat on its bones, and that was Project Red Light. That was probably the first story I ever heard about UFOs and and Area 51, Project Red Light. Uh, Someone uh, had had gotten their their hands on this, this story and tried to track it down using Freedom of Information Act requests. And what it all came down to was um, back in, I think around, might have been around 1980, uh, a gentleman who had worked at Area 51 in the early 1960s doing electrical work in the the hangars and buildings. In the 1980s, he told one of the UFO researchers at the time, he said, hey, I was out at Area 51. Uh, I was working on electrical stuff and one of the hangars, I, you know, there, there was something going on there. And, you know, usually you know, if it was outdoors, they would you know, put me in a windowless room so I couldn't see what was going on. I never heard anything 
Um, and then they'd let me out again. I, I wouldn't see anything. But the two things he did see, uh, one was a wooden crate, which had been stenciled with the, uh, it was from Edwards Air Force Base, it had been stenciled with the notation Project Red Light. And he didn't know what that was. And the other thing he saw was a strange looking vehicle. He At, at first he said, well, I, I thought it was an airplane, but I didn't see any tails. Uh, it was partly hidden, hidden behind a hangar. It might've been about a half mile away. It had a kind of a silvery pewter type color. And uh, so in the, the years that ensued, you know, the next, you know, couple of decades, he just sort of equated that object with this Project Red Light. And, you know, he'd heard about flying saucers. And so he thought, well, maybe that was a flying saucer I saw. Well, that got kicked around for a long time because all these UFO researchers glommed onto it and started saying, well, let's sure. file Freedom of Information Act requests to the Air Force, to the Atomic Energy Commission, the CIA, anybody. And the results that came back were, we don't know what you're talking about. Well, we do know what they're talking about now because uh, the CIA has declassified some stuff on the Oxcart program. And it turns out that Project Red Light was a funding channel to get uh, to procure goods and services for Oxcart from vendors that were not cleared to be witting of Oxcart. If, uh, if you needed maintenance for a support aircraft or you needed some spare parts or materials or something or whatever but the person you're buying it from you couldn't tell them about this secret spy plane program you know you could only brief them you know to some minor extent just enough to get you know, the, the materials you're trying to get they'd be given a, a red light briefing and the uh you know, the goods or services would be paid for through this funding channel so that's what Project Red Light was. And it was it was very similar. It was something that was done for the U-2 program back in the 1950s, only that was called Project Shoehorn. Hmm. Interesting. So let's see, where do I want to go next with this? I just have like two more questions. Um, sure. So what do you think the, the biggest technological flop was that didn't make it out of Area 51? Well, let's see. I, I don't know. I, I guess that's it's never it's never a clear answer because even the failures pretty much produced something that was worthwhile. Right. If you think about it, that's science. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, tacit blue was originally being tested with the idea of creating a battlefield surveillance aircraft that could be stealthy and fly in daylight near, you know, close to the battle, battle area. And in the end, it was decided that that was probably uh, too dangerous, that it would likely get shot down. But all of that great technology developed for Tacit Blue went into things like the B-2 stealth bomber and missile development and other, you know, uh, aircraft like the Joint Stars uh, surveillance aircraft. So all of that technology went somewhere useful, even if the original intent didn't get followed through. Um, similarly, Project Aqualine in the 1970s, that was a drone program to fly a, uh, an unmanned vehicle that would operate, you know, pretty much autonomously and be disguised to look like a bird in flight. Uh, that was a terrible failure at the time because it was, you know, went over budget, there were technical problems. You know, in a lot of ways, the concept was well ahead of the, uh, the time for the technology, but the technology that went into it, micro-miniaturized electronics and camera systems and long endurance, uh, small engines for drones, things like that, has all emerged into the modern world of unmanned aerial vehicles. And so we're, you know, we're, we're seeing a real payoff now. You heard about aliens and um, spacecraft in 1989. Did you follow up on any of that stuff when you first heard about it or did you disregard it? Well, I mean, you know, obviously uh, I talked to plenty of people and, you know, I've talked to 
dozens and dozens of people who've worked out at Area 51 and Tonopah and elsewhere. And, you know, when I, when I bring up the Lazar stories or the UFO stories, they, it's a combination of they'll, they'll either laugh at it because they think it's ridiculous or they'll get mad because they think it's ridiculous. And it's, it's caused such a, a spotlight to be thrown on, on area 51. It's sort of a, a double-edged sword because on the, on the one hand, it's an attractive nuisance that makes everybody want to look at area 51. But on the other hand, it creates this chuckle factor that now if I talk to someone, you know, in a, a sober academic setting and say, you know, I'm an expert on the history of area 51, they'll say, Oh, you mean the place of the flying saucers? And they'll laugh, you know, and it's just kind of a joke. And it, it, it sort of short circuits, uh, you know, any kind of serious conversation. So on the one hand, those stories help protect the secrecy. And on the other hand, they remove the secrecy because they bring people from all over the world, you know, studying this thing. I mean, think about it. There are secret things going on at lots of other military bases, but you don't see people camped out on the borders with cameras and telescopes and stuff trying to see what's going on. These things just happen quietly uh, in the background, and no one's the wiser. It's worth camping out, though, because there's uh, there's stuff that goes on there that's pretty amazing. I just saw some on Dreamland Resort website. I just saw some photos people had taken of a military craft and an older military craft, and it's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, also on Dreamland <laughs> website, there's uh, there's a link, and I tried to. Um, use that link and it was jobs at area 51 is that is that site no longer available and um if it is how do we get a job at area 51 because i'm <laughs> gonna pursue that the, I, I'm not I have kidding. certainly seen i have certainly seen job listings for uh positions that you know to, to my mind are very clearly at area 51 or tonabai uh they're you know require having high level security clearances and being able to hang on to them uh, requires commuting to remote areas and, and staying throughout the week. And those descriptions sound basically the same as pretty much every description I've heard from someone who's worked there. So uh, those jobs are out there. And I guess uh, if people are qualified for them, you know, they're presumably the ones, uh, the ones hired are the ones who are trustworthy and have the clearances. Any idea how they get the jobs? I mean, is it, is it, Based on, um, I mean, obviously there's, you can, if there's really, really a Taco John's, I don't know if there's Taco John's. I would <laughs> love it if there was a Taco John's. I'd be there in a minute. But, um, you know, obviously they're they're probably good paying jobs and they do require a high level of security. How do they, you know, how, how are they accomplishing that now? Because, I mean, things have changed so much and it's so hard to get people to, um accept jobs and take jobs that um, require such a dedication. Um, have you ever heard of them having a hard time hiring? Uh, I, I, I don't know for sure. I know some of the older programs, you know, people who had worked out there for a while eventually, you know, gave up and went to other, other jobs because they were tired of having to be away from their families for so long and not being able to talk about what they were doing. It was a, a very frustrating kind of, uh, kind of life. The cash incentives for, uh, you know, the hardship of, of working in a remote site were helpful, but, uh, you know, for, for people, particularly those with families, it's, uh, it's just really difficult. So you've got to be really dedicated. And certainly I think a lot of the people who work out there really are dedicated. And certainly when you see the, um, uh, the resumes of some of these uh, folks, they're, they're really smart and uh highly motivated and you know qu quite a few of the uh, the pilots have been uh, astronaut candidates and some of them actually became astronauts so it really kind of tells you, you know, what what level they're operating at sure there's video by john lear and bob i i don't remember who took the video but um john lazar I'm sorry, John Lear, Bob Lazar, George Knapp. I mean, they were to the east of Area 51 and took some pictures of lights. Um, any uh, any idea what that was? But there's a lot of lights, obviously, from there at night. Well, 
Yeah, there's there's a few things I, I can say about that. One is that uh, Glenn, Glenn Campbell did an experiment out there one time. He was on what was known as Freedom Ridge. You can't get up there anymore because uh, the Air Force yeah. has taken it away. But at the time, you could climb up there and sit there and watch the base. And the base was you know, about uh, 10 miles away, which sounds awfully far. But boy, you felt like you were right on their doorstep. And most people didn't uh, didn't quite have the ambition to, to do that. So they just stop on the Highway 375, which is about another 10 miles or so further away. Mm-hmm. So th- there was one night when those people uh, out by the highway were looking and they saw this light seem to rise up straight into the air and then uh, came came down and they thought, wow, yeah, we just saw a flying saucer. This thing was levitating. But Glenn, he was up on Freedom Ridge, so he was a lot closer, and he could see the runway and the base and everything directly. Right. And what he saw through his binoculars was a 737 come up out of Las Vegas, and from that perspective, if you were back by the highway, it would have looked like it was just rising straight into the air, uh, when in fact it was simply climbing out of uh, McCarran Airport and coming north and then dropping down landing at Groom Lake, which is what Glenn saw. So uh, his theory was that a lot of these um, supposed UFOs were probably just misidentification of aircraft, uh, conventional aircraft that were being seen. All you could see is the light. And other times there were military activities at night, dropping flares that uh, hang under parachutes and seem to, to hover in the air and things like that. Um, my biggest problem with the UFO videos is that they are almost invariably lights in the sky at night. And so it's just lights against a black background and they're usually out of focus and, you know, there's no, there's no context, there's no scale and it really doesn't tell you anything. And a lot of the time you'll have someone say, well, look, I took a picture of a flying triangle. Well, how do you know it's a triangle? Well, look, there's these three lights. But what, what makes you think those lights are on the corners? Almost every airplane looks like a flying triangle at night because of the positioning of these, these lights on the, the fuselage and the wings. Uh, I used to see flying triangles at night in the Antelope Valley, and you know I could cl- clearly hear that it was a C-130 flying over my head. But you know, you, you just the, these nighttime videos just don't tell you much. For sure. How many books have you written? Well, I've written more than a dozen books, and the last time we talked, we were discussing my Nevada test site book, which one. was kind of a, uh, it's, it's you know, I, I wrote it for Arcadia Publishing, and I had previously written a title for them called Area 51. Mm-hmm. And so Nevada test site, it's separate, but it's also kind of a companion piece, and it's intended to be such. And so my most recent book, also in that same series, is Tonopah Test Range. And so um, that sort of rounds out the trilogy for the uh, spooky Nevada testing places. So, so I've got Nevada Test Site, Area 51, and Tonopah Test Range, all from Arcadia Publishing. And they're just nice little capsule histories with lots of pictures. And uh, if anyone wants to, to, to learn the real stories of these places, I, I recommend them highly. Tonopah Test Range is an exciting place as well. And of course, I've always been enthralled ever since I heard of Area 51. Um, Peter, you've totally amazed me over the years. I remember seeing you often on TV and, and I missed that. Um, it seems like people are more now into um, some sort of hidden meanings and, and um, things that may or may not exist at Area 51. But, um, you know, the, the real heroes in, in, our, in, our, in our world you know, have come and gone from Area 51 over so many decades. It just continues to be amazing. Um, What do you think next is going to come out of Area 51? I mean, it just seems to be a a, a site for for people who have all kinds of different interests. Well, considering, uh, considering the state of world events, I sure hope that there's going to be some really, really good stuff coming out of Area 51 for our national defense because uh, the world's getting a little crazy out there with the invasion of Ukraine and uh, you know, China's making moves in, uh, in Asia. And 
you know, this, uh, it's, a, it's a scary world. It's not the same kind of scary world that I had when I was a kid where you had the, the Soviet Union and the U.S., you know, with their nuclear weapons pointed at one another. This is a, a different and more, uh, more unstable kind of configuration. Boots on the ground, we have no idea which way they're going. Peter Merlin, thank you so much. Thanks. You can find my website at www.myalienlifepodcast.com and please subscribe to my latest downloads at iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, and at podbean.com. And please follow me and like me on Facebook and Twitter. My Alien Life is written and produced for broadcast at Studio 254 in the Northern Rocky Mountains. The music you are hearing is produced and created by Elion. You can find all Elion's work online at Heart Dance Records. Oh,